we'll see how it goes. Um, so yeah, I'm Sean Smith from Florida State University. I'm going to just get us started. Um, so the way we're going to we planned on doing this is uh, Katie and I are going to go through the slide deck. It's about a well, probably about 40 minutes for our presentation, uh, but then obviously open the floor up to uh, all manner of questions at that point because I'm sure there's topics we're going to touch on or or miss that you're going to be interested in, and that's what we're here for is to to try to answer those questions. So yeah, so here's just kind of an outline. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is go through. Uh, there was a survey done before uh, this um, this session, um, and so we're going to go through the survey results because there were some interesting things in there. Um, and then Katie's going to uh, focus more on the flow water systems for a little bit, a uh, crash course on system design and water wall design, and uh, some uh, sensor maintenance and cal practices. Uh, and then I'll be doing uh, a similar thing for meteorology sensors, uh, but my focus will be on uh, a crash course on sensor placement, because that was one of the questions that we were asked to uh, address uh, in this session. And then we're going to talk a little bit about metadata and the data life cycle with a particular focus on the uh, rolling deck to repository post cruise distributions, because uh, there were some questions about uh, those uh, as well. Um, for those of you that work with the uh, university fleet, uh, those data sets go off to um, R2R after every cruise. And also, we have uh, uh, Drew Clark on the line from R2R. Uh, so he's around to uh, help answer some questions there because he's much more involved with the, the data distribution work uh, than I am for R2R. So, so he'll be able to uh, answer more questions, specific ones. All righty. So starting off with the survey, um, the first thing we looked into was experience level. Um, and for the 15 folks that responded, the first thing that struck us was that the majority of the people that responded have less than five years uh, experience in, in the marine tech field. Uh, this uh, makes sense given that it's, there's been a lot of turnover recently and new people coming into the field. So we've seen a lot of new techs uh, in the fleet. Um, so that's one of the reasons why these trainings are, are really, really important uh, to, to give you the opportunity to, to ask questions uh, and, and learn about uh, some of these systems. On the right hand side are two questions. This was kind of interesting. We asked about your comfort level with flow through systems and sensors on the top and the meteorological systems and sensors on the bottom. And I'll note the scale here. One is basically the uncomfortable little experience or five being very comfortable and, and experienced. Um, and so there seems that among the group that responded more comfort with the flow through systems and sensors than with the meteorological sensors. Uh, so um, that was just a, a bit interesting to me as the, as the weather guy in the group here. Um, so yeah, so hoping to be able to answer some of your questions uh, today. And then when it came to the data packages, these post-cruise data packages going to R to R, it really did strike us that nobody said they were, you know, very comfortable or experienced with these. Um, and there tended to be more people with less uh, comfort and experience. Now, one of the things we didn't ask in this survey was whether or not you as a technician are actually working with those post-cruise distributions. Not all techs do. It depends on how the data is managed post cruise at different institutions. Uh, some institutions have a data manager that'll actually package all that up post cruise, uh, whereas some there's one tech does everything. So, in terms of flow through systems, we just want to see you know what types of sensors you had on your ships. Um, very there's very clearly a common set of sensors on most ships with you know intake thermometers and debubblers and uh, thermal salinographs and fluorometers being pretty much common to most of the ships. Uh, and then some more mix when you get into like the newer multi-channel fluorometers, you know pH sensors, you know, not being quite as widely uh, used on ships. One of the other questions we wanted to get info on was what you found as your challenges with working for fl with flow through systems. And it was kind of interesting that this was kind of split in half between um, maintenance challenges and other challenges were really more focused on the design 
and and um, uh, basically order of operations on the on the flow through system. So you know things like what order should the sensors be and what should the flow rates be for for the system, you know, as it's running. So Katie's going to address a lot of this in in her section. Looking at the meteorological sensors again, just you know, finding out what you have on board the ship. The the number one thing that struck me when I saw this was, you know, only twenty six percent responded about having a hygrometer on the ship, and that immediately got me to thinking um, we might have a terminology issue here, uh, because uh, the hygrometer is the instrument that measures humidity or moisture, and almost every ship carries one of these, um, and it's usually coupled with the thermometer. Uh, in a single system uh, in, in on a lot of ships. So I'm expecting here, it's again, going back to that, um, that slide talking about experience with the MET systems and sensors. This term probably just wasn't well known uh, to, to, the, to the folks responding to the survey. But that's what a hygrometer is. It's a, it's a, it's a temperature humidity sensor that allows you to measure the moisture uh, of the atmosphere. Okay, so the next thing we asked about was basically calibration and verification. And so the first one was really what kind of timeline do you have for your flow through sensors and your meteorological sensors uh, for, for calibration? Um, and, uh, you know, it was nice to see that the majority is are doing this on about a yearly basis, uh, with some of them being being longer timeline. But during our our sections, Katie and I will both talk about some of our, of our recommendations for for calibration uh, and time intervals for the different types of weather and ocean sensors. <laughs> In terms of verification, question of whether or not you do field verification or field calibration of these systems. Um, I, again, here it was. Uh, Pretty clear that the majority of you were not doing this um, on a regular basis. But also, what I found interesting is that almost all the responses that we got in terms of kind of more details were focused on the uh, the flow water systems. So I'm wondering whether or not many of the groups are doing any of this kind of field verification on the MET systems. Um, and there are things you can do, uh, which I can certainly address. So the last thing I wanted to introduce before I pass it off to Katie to talk more about flow through systems, um, we have kicked off uh, through the best practices uh, group for uh, RV Tech, a um, best practices group that's basically focusing on developing a document for best practices for research vessel based uh, flow through systems. Um, and this is something that we kicked off in 2021, took kind of a hiatus in 22, and I, I've been leading this um, as kind of the cat herder. Um, and we got regrouped in April this year, had another meeting, and now we're planning on have me having meetings every month for the rest of this year to try to get into the point where we can have a draft document ready for RV Tech in 2023. The key thing to note here is what we're focusing on in this set, this best practices is the flow water system, which uh, Kate is going to bring up here in a minute. You know, the, the intakes, the sea chests, the pipes, the plumbing, the tubing. We're not really going into specific sensors in this. Uh, there are other best practice documents for those sensors themselves. This is about the end to end system uh, on the ship and how to you know, manage it, maintain it you know, recommendations for, for uh, sensor placement and, and design of those systems. So, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Katie and just, Katie, just tell me next when you want me to hit the next slide. Sounds good. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everybody. I'm super happy to be here today. I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to practice my speed talking here. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a crash course on science seawater system design and a crash course on water wall design, as well as talk a little bit about the sensors, maintenance, and cowbell practices. Next. Thanks, Sean. So um, I just wanted to throw up this very generic diagram of a science seawater system design. And I think one of the things I really want to point out here is that it's really important to know your system. This is really the first step to ensuring quality data. And a lot of scientists are actually going to be interested in this information uh, and, and probably ask you about it. So it's good to understand uh, how your system works, what the design of your system is. 
So typically you have water coming in. This is your intake. And on ships, it, you can have multiple of these, right? You can have um, multiple intakes in multiple locations. It's good to know which one is feeding your water wall where you're taking your measurements. In many cases, there's a forward and an aft one. The forward one is, is typically preferable by science because it um, means kind of cleaner water. Whereas if the water is coming across the hull um, and you're feeding from your aft, it's it may be more contamination from the hull. Obviously, there can be issues with a forward intake with um, bubbles, and we'll talk about that some more. So it's just good to know what your depth of your intake is, as well as the different locations and what locations are being used to feed your water wall. So there's typically a grate on the hull. It's usually millimeters in size. And I say that because it's, it's interesting to know those things as well, because in many cases, scientists are measuring particles in these systems. So you want to know what kind of filters are throughout your system. Obviously, millimeters, these are large. These are meant to keep debris out of your sea chest. Um, and it says scientific sea chest here. That's also important. Ships have other sea chests that can pull in water for other things like engine coolant. You want to make sure that um, you're using your scientific sea chest, right? Because they are typically designed for that. They have specific coatings um, that aren't, you know, copper based, for example, where you would have um, copper being toxic to phytoplankton or other things you might be measuring downstream. Uh, sometimes they have ultrasonic probes for helping to control biofouling. Those are becoming more common in, in some of the new ships. And when you think ultrasonic, you think, all right, sonic bursts, right? You are basically bursting cells to control some of the issues with biofouling. Uh, obviously, this is a problem if you are running this during operations um, on your measurements that are, that are taking place downstream because you're bursting cells. So it's just good to know um, what practices are in place when these things are being operated uh, to make sure your, your measurements downstream aren't affected. Um, there's usually a, a, some kind of valve that controls the flow and then you go into the pipes and there's an intake temperature that's as close to the intake as possible. This is, a, this is really important for many scientists because this is the first order kind of temperature measurement that they're using for a lot of their data. But it's also important because we want to understand thermal contamination. So how much is the temperature changing between the intake and the, the water wall itself where you have a lot of your main sensors mounted? And this ties into what's your piping, how are the pipes insulated? These are all good things to know. If you have good pipe insulation, you, you shouldn't see huge amounts of thermal contamination depending how far your water travels. Um, there's typically a couple mechanisms for being able to clean at the intake. You have freshwater flush or uh, ability to inject a cleaning agent. And in some cases you can have compressed air blow down as well. <clears throat> I show here too a, a duplex basket strainer. And, uh, I, I'm glad somebody put strainer on the, the questions for the survey because it allowed me an opportunity to kind of talk about it a little bit. And um, this has been something that recently came up in some discussions I had where a ship just had a single strainer and in order to unclog it, they had to shut down the entire system. And this was one of those conversations where it's like, get a, get a basket strainer. This is what allows you to actually be able to isolate, clean out a strainer, um, without having to shut down operations. Uh, it's also nice because you can throw in a bleach tab in one of these strainers and run it through the system. Uh, typically the, the basket, the strainer size is an eighth of an inch. Again, good things to know because downstream scientists are typically measuring particles. They wanna know what they're looking at. The last thing anybody who knows me is gonna say, oh gosh, here she goes talking about pumps, but I wanna bring up pumps and seeing if we can start to shift our fleet from the use of impeller pumps. So next slide. So this is Katie's soapbox moment. I want everybody to take a deep breath and prepare themselves for it. But I also want them to take a deep breath and thank phytoplankton for basically 50% of the oxygen that you're breathing. This is a phytoplankton appreciation slide. Uh, they take up carbon dioxide, they convert it to oxygen, they are crucial to understanding carbon dynamics in our oceans, and many scientists refer to them as particles. Um, so, you know, in thinking about pumps and particles, uh, impeller pumps basically tear up the particles as they're coming in. Um, so we want to think about, in terms of design of our science seawater systems, things that we can do to ensure that we have particle integrity. So there was a paper by Ivona Setnik and others looking at these different types of pumps and how they affect particle assemblages. Um, so if possible, start to have these conversations about integrating uh, diaphragm pumps or screw pumps instead. And I am happy to talk ad nauseum about this, but 
um, we can we can bring it up at the discussion if anybody's interested. So next slide. Maintenance. So this was an interesting one. We got a, a question in the, the survey cleaning cycle for scientific seawater systems. How often should we run a chlorination cycle? This is a great question. And um, my advice would say would be work with your engineers to flush the sea chest and the scientific seawater pipes at ble with bleach at regular intervals. So you're probably saying, Katie, what's regular intervals? Um, that's also a very good question that I don't have a fantastic answer for. But what I will tell you is it really depends on the ship. It depends on your operating environment. So it's good to know um, where you're operating and where you may experience more biofouling versus um, other places. So Lori Jernick and um, others, you know, they measure oxygen, they measure carbon dynamics, and they use underway systems to do so. So they did a test and they found that bleach cleaning was effective for up to 45 days following treatment, with the caveat of what I just said with we have more things we need to understand in terms of um, how temperature may affect this, how uh, operating environment may affect this. Um, but I think 45 days is at least a, a somewhere to start, right? So uh, the other question is, is bleach the right treatment, right? Like it's a valid question and, and we get that a lot. And I hope that we can come to some sort of consensus within the best practices group to be able to provide these recommendations. But what I'll tell you is, you ask a biologist, you ask a chemist, and you're probably going to get different answers. Um, <clears throat> for now, I would um, say freshwater flushing after every cruise, integrate bleach treatments when you can, um, is the way to go. And hopefully, we'll be able to provide you more recommendations with our best practices group. I think the other thing is kind of the jury's still out on the value of either keeping freshwater in your science seawater system pipes or draining them and having them dry while you're in port. Um, again, stay tuned. There's still work to do on this. Uh, next slide. Crash course on water wall design. So again, just this plea, know your system and your sensors. And then we'll talk about tubing and fittings and some other tips and tricks. So go ahead and next slide. Um, flow through system, you know, we'll talk about the sensor maintenance and management, um, cal valve practices that you can do. But I, what I want to focus on because of our time is debubbler flow meter. And then we can also, um, what I did was I generated kind of a sensor summary table that has a lot of this information. I could spend two hours, probably more than that actually, on each one of these sensors and implications with design and, and maintenance and management and best practices. Um, but I don't have time to do that. So I made a, a little summary table that hopefully is a good reference guide for you all. So next slide. And again, we can talk about any of this um, during our discussion. So debubblers, debubblers remove bubbles from the sensor stream. Uh, you can get them in multiple sizes. One thing to consider when you're getting when you're sizing your debubbler is that uh, account for the 25% that's going to need to go to exhaust at least. Um, in terms of maintenance, anybody that's seen these um, knows that there's a cylinder. It's kind of opaque. You can still kind of see through it, but it's it's valuable to add uh, Velcro, neoprene, or some other va uh, black fabric to help cover that cylinder to reduce biofouling and uh, help insulate the water as well. There's a locking ring. It's really easy to remove. It's really easy to clean. So um, again, cleaning frequency is going to depend on that operating environment. But what I will say is anybody who's seen these, it's, it's a little bit hazy, right? So if you have biofilms that are starting to accumulate in there, it might not be as noticeable. So just make sure you're integrating cleaning of this into your end of cruise scene, uh, cleaning practices. And that'll go a long way. So next slide. Flow meters and flow rates. So these measure flow within a system and are really critical to monitoring flow. And these can be used uh, also to assess residence time. So how long the water is within a system. Uh, one thing I did, don't go into detail here is flow regulation. We could have a whole conversation about that alone. Um, <clears throat> but there are various types of flow meters that are used in the fleet. Typically they're paddle wheel or electromagnetic. Um, and in terms of flow through system general flow recommendations, it's two to 10 liters. And I'm going to talk about that a little more in the next slide here. So this is that sensor summary. Um, each sensor, like I said, has independent cleaning requirements. You need to refer to the best practices for that. My one public service announcement is use lens paper on optical faces. Chem wipes aren't good enough. Uh, and what I did here was I tried to summarize the sensors, the common models, what the recommended fa uh, factory calibration is to debubble or not to debubble, uh, 
the ideal flow rate, supporting measurements, and field verification or calibration procedures that you can do. A couple of things of note is you look at the ideal flow rates here and you say, hmm, you know, we're looking at two liters really per minute um, on that upper end and that what I previously showed was two to 10 liters. I would always focus on that higher end, if not pushing those boundaries uh, beyond two liters per minute. And there's a couple of reasons for that to consider that I'll talk about. The other thing I'm on to show here is supporting measurements. Um, it's important to realize and to remember it, that, you know, things like pH, things like DO, PCO2, those all require temperature and salinity data to be able to transform that data and correct it. So it's always good to remember that the quality of those measurements, those basic measurements are key to the quality of measurements of other sensors as well. So next slide, please. To debubble or not to debubble. My typical rule of thumb is if it uses light, it's right to debubble. These are all optical sensors, right? Uh, if it measures gas, then pass. And this is primarily PCO2 because many of the PCO2 systems are going into a shower head equilibrator. They're bringing all of that gas from the water into a headspace to measure. So anything like that, don't debubble. Um, others like a TSG, an oxygen sensor, whether it's an optode or a membrane, um, or a pH sensor, typically it's good to debubble to help reduce noise that you see in data. A lot of times bubbles can stick to membranes and other things that can cause um, havoc on data. I'll show some examples of that. And bubbles are uh, optic scientists nemesis, right? Like whenever possible and thinking about the design of your system, you always wanna push bubbles up and out. So water in through the bottom and out through the top to kind of create that path of least resistance. There's some other trouble with the bubble techniques we can talk about. Back pressure downstream is definitely your friend if you need to reduce the size of a tubing, if you have a ball valve that you can adjust and just offering a little bit of back pressure goes a long way if you have significant bubbles in your system. The other thing is that higher flow rate. Make your high rates or your flow rates a little bit higher um, to be able to make sure you're pushing water up and through the system. Um, don't over tighten your tubing connections. Many sensors still have barb fittings, um, unfortunately, so you can't have quick connects, but, uh, and people use hose clamps to be able to kind of tighten that down. Don't over tighten those, otherwise you're gonna introduce air into the system. Also check your connections with some of your flow cells, like the C-Star transmissometer is notorious for this. Make sure that your sleeves are well secured. Um, faulty O-rings can cause real problems, and I'll show an example of that in the next plot. And then just thinking about other mechanisms. If you have really bad bubbles in your system, having degassing wise at high points, and this can be at the intake, this can be at your sensor manifold, um, having some mechanism for air bleed. Next slide. This is what noisy data looks like. So this is an example of a C-star data and you can see the blue. That's pretty typical of a bubble response for any optical sensor. It is out of control, right? So anytime you see this signal, um, this is typically indicative of bubbles. And then you can see the red that's kind of a nice flat line and, and similar to what you should be seeing with raw um, beam attenuation values. So you start to see the signal, um, then you probably have a bubble issue. Next slide, please. Tubing and fittings. Okay, so always maintain a full uh, spare set of tubing so you can easily swap them in and out, even, even if it's during a cruise or, or always after a cruise, please. But do a quick check. Take your pinky finger, take a chem wipe, insert it into the tubing. If you see funk, then replace it. Uh, biofilms accumulate really easily. It's good to just keep that tubing swapped out. Uh, minimize tubing lengths. So you wanna minimize residence time between sensors. Um, but take caution, you know, don't create any vertical loops or tight bends in the tubing. Those are just uh, prone to issues with air pockets or, or other things. Um, go dark when you can. Use opaque tubing. That can help reduce biofouling and use quick connects where possible. I love quick connects. I'm all about quick connects and union fittings. Let's make it easy. Let's make the maintenance easy. Let's be able to pop things on and off. Let's clean them. You know, that, that can go a really long way rather than someone looking at a wall and going like, oh God, I got to take all this stuff off. <laughs> Think about that in the design and incorporate those design features in there so it makes it easier to maintenance. Tubing type, uh, again, I like quick connects, I like semi-rigid. I go for PEX. You can get PEX in multiple different colors. Um, make it pretty, 
Uh, if you have to go with barb fittings and um, you need, here are some other tubing recommendations. Uh, these typically have a higher amount of plasticizers in them, so they help kind of reduce that biofouling. Um, use bleach, you can use RBS, Turgitol, and hopefully we'll provide some of these recommendations in terms of what to use for cleaning tubing. Um, but these are all decent recommendations to clean the tubing. You can soak it in these solutions overnight and then um, rinse well with fresh water. Never uh, clean the tubing or the system with sensors in line because not all sensors are going to be compatible with these cleaning products. So make sure you have the ability to isolate them. And that's good to work into your design as well, having the capability to isolate a sensor. So if you do need to maintenance it, you don't need to take down the entire system to be able to do so. All right, next slide. Order of operations and sensor orientation. This is a good question and this comes down to what is your sensor doing? Again, is it an active or is it a passive sensor? When I think of active sensors, I think of things that may alter the stream and affect the measurements downstream. And at its extreme case, I'm talking about things that may inject reagents into a line. Um, those are obviously active sensors, but some people think even about light right? Like how is light affecting the measurement? And we have a lot of things that measure optically that use light. Um, and that's fluorometers is one good example. But what I want to caution here is that when you're talking about fluorometers and what's happening with exciting a cell, right? Like you are blasting the water with light and you're looking for a response. So there's an excitation and an emission. The time scale of those processes is really small. And I put milliseconds to seconds here, but on, in reality, like photosystem responses are, are picoseconds or nanoseconds, right? Like they're very, very small. So I wouldn't worry too much, I guess is what I'm saying about thinking about how light is affecting measurements downstream. You can put a fluorometer and a transmissometer in line with each other. You're not gonna have big problems. Um, in terms of passive sensors, these are things that don't affect the measurements downstream. So these are things like your thermometers. Um, sensor orientation, sometimes it does matter with the sensor, so you have to pay attention to that. But when at all possible, mount that sensor so the water, again, is going through the bottom and out through the top. That's always going to be the path of least resistance and push bubbles up and out. But do pay attention to the flow path because some of that does matter with, with different sensors. Next. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Sorry, I'm talking really fast, but other tips and tricks. Uh, light contamination, pay attention to potential sources of light that could come in. Um, this can cause biofouling and, and help promote biofouling. Filtered signals, this is another Katie Soapbox moment I'm not gonna go into, but if you wanna discuss it during the discussion or reach out to me later, there are other mechanisms that you can put in place to be able to monitor biofouling of a system. So one way to do that is to have a filtered signal if you turn it to a 0.2 micron filtered signal, what does that look like? It should be a blank, right? And your sensor, you should know what your sensor is reading out of that. That can be an indicator of biofouling in your system. Um, so that can be a really nice way of identifying biofouling and then taking action. Uh, flow through wall design. Again, this is a really fun thing to think about uh, in terms of materials and design to really promote the ease of maintenance and the flexibility of being able to mount and demount sensors, you know, uh, to remove them for uh, maintenance. Marine, three, Marine Tech 3D printing repository for sensor mounts. I don't know if this exists. If it does, please tell me. It would be really cool to have. Uh, but Kate Kuba actually started um, making some 3D printing, um, some files for, for sensor mounts. And I think this could be really cool uh, to have available to the community. Last thing I'll say is flexibility and manifold design for users to be able to easily plug into. When scientists want to bring a sensor on board, think about how to design your manifold so you can create an outlet really easily. And this boils down to like, use, use union fittings. They're really great. They're easy to put on and off. Uh, you can clean them really easily, um, add, subtract, whatever you need. So I think that's, that's it from me. Okay, thanks, Katie. And so now from below the ocean to above the ocean, uh, I'm just going to do a, a, a quick uh, intro to meteorological sensors. Um, we'll talk briefly about some calibration and maintenance and then uh, go into a quick crash course on sensor placement. So um, one too far. There we go. So uh, common weather sensors. Um, most of you are probably familiar with these or have at least seen some of these up on the ship and had to deal with them. But uh, I went ahead and broke them down by the, the terms that we use in the, in the weather world. 
Uh, the anemometers, um, wind speed and direction, they come in mechanical, they come in sonic, and they also are part of these all-in-one systems like uh, the Viasala WXT, where you see the sonic anemometer part up on the top. Uh, just emphasizing the fact that with these measure your wind relative to the vessel, um, in order to turn that into a wind reference to the Earth, you need to use your navigation data. So you have to have your, your course heading and speed over the ground to correct these values uh, to get them referenced to the Earth. We aren't going to go into details there, but if you want to talk about that sometime, we can. I, that's another thing I can talk about hours for hours. The thermometer and the hygrometer, um, most ships, and there's some examples here, most ships will be carrying a, a hygrometer, which is going to have both a humidity probe and an air temperature sensor built in to one system. Um, the air temperature is needed to actually derive the humidity uh, as part of that uh, sensor. But it's also important to carry an independent thermometer if you can, that's just measuring air temperature. Uh, the reason being that oftentimes these hygrometers um, have some kind of heater in them to keep them from icing or, or the like, and that'll actually skew your air temperature. So it won't actually give you an actual air temperature, but it will give you an accurate air temperature for calculating the humidity within the system. Barometers are your sensors like this Cetra for measuring atmospheric pressure. Um, rain gauges come in all types. Uh, the ones that you are probably most familiar with are the volumetric kind, like this RM Young, but actually the optical systems like OSI systems are, are becoming more and more favored on ships uh, because they, they have uh, no, no moving parts um, and they actually have been showing to be much more accurate uh, in, from the science community. And then radiometers, there's a lot of radiometers out there in the world. Uh, you can measure all aspects of the radiometer or, or radiometric spectrum uh, coming into the ship. Um, but the most common are short wave coming down from the atmosphere, long wave coming down from the atmosphere, and then the photosynthetic. And here's an example. I think this is from the Sekuliak showing their, their, their three radiometers all in, in a cluster. In terms of calibration, uh, this lists basically, again, the same uh, the basic instruments and uh, recommended calibration cycles. Mechanical anemometers are your things that need uh, uh, calibrated the most often because these have moving parts and they do tend to degrade. Um, so they need to be calibrated probably at least every year, if not more often. Uh, the nice thing is most companies actually make bench calibration systems for this. You can actually buy a calibration kit that you can actually do this in your own lab. You don't need to send these out um, to, to make sure that they're working properly. Uh, so at least you can test them, find out what's wrong with them, and get spare parts and oftentimes fix these you know, in-house. Um, of course, sonic anemometers are becoming much more common uh, because they have no moving parts. Um, and they are very robust sensors. Three to five years, they work just fine. Uh, and generally, they don't, they don't get recaled. You just replace them. Um, you just get a new one. Um, for the hygrometers and thermometers, especially the hygrometers, these are, again, about a one to two year for, for needing to be um, you know, recaled. But again, when I say recaled, in this case, Generally, what you're doing is replacing them. Uh, there aren't many companies anymore that are calibrating hygrometers. They have parts you can take out and replace uh, in them, generally speaking. But cleaning is really important with the hygrometers um, because most hygrometers are using a, an electrical capacitance. And when they get salt on them, salt's a great conductor. It changes the capacitance for you know, that, that sensor, and the, that'll start tending to make the, the, the measurements of humidity uh, go or drift on you. But it's a really easy thing. You basically go up and just give them a good freshwater flush uh, to rinse off as much of the salt as you can. Um, and, and that will pretty much be all they need uh, to be happy for one to two years. Um, radiometers, this is actually a new recommendation. Um, there's a best practices group focused on radiometers on ships um, and in recent years, they or in the past, they they thought radiometers were good for you know three to four years uh, in a marine environment. Their recommendations now are to uh, recal these every two years uh, because of the harshness of the environment they're working in. 
Um, again, this is true if they're they're routinely cleaned and inspected and have desiccants replaced on them. Barometers, very robust sensors, very few moving parts. These things last for for years. Um, they do still get recal. Um, you know, almost every company will actually calibrate these uh, and send them back. Um, so you can keep a, the same sensor for for years if you, or maybe decades if you actually get it in for recal. Siphon rain gauges are also problematic. Um, they have a lot of moving parts. They do tend to leak. They tend to have you know O rings and stuff that start to drip. These things need pretty much yearly um, you know maintenance uh, to to make sure that they're they're going to be working properly. This is one of the reasons we actually are moving more toward uh, recommending optical rain gauges. Um, they they have, uh, but what I can't tell you is I don't have any uh, documentation in hand about what their recal cycles are. I expect it's going to be multiple years uh, on these, but they are optical sensors. So, you know, depending on how they're bumped or vibration and that kind of stuff, they probably will need to be recaled uh, every few years. And then these all-in-ones like the WXTs, this is where it gets tricky because these are multiple sensors in one device. Um, and some of the components, a lot of the components have varying requirements. The sonic anemometer, you don't really have to do much on with these, but their pressure, temperature, humidity unit, most of them have uh, modules you can pull out and replace. And we recommend doing that every two years with these sensors, um, just because, again, it's, it's very much tied to this hygrometer cycle for, for those sensors. So trying to move on as quickly as I can through some of this, sensor placement. Um, this is all about sensor placement. I have a slide basically for the different sensors, uh, but I'm gonna try to go through fairly quickly. Uh, the most critical thing for meteorological sensors is where the sensor is located. It has to be in a location that is as best exposed to the atmosphere as you can get it um, without being affected by alterations in the airflow by the vessel structure. Um, exposure to sea spray, salt contamination, and primarily vessel exhaust in a lot of cases. Um, and then um, it's always a trade-off between putting it someplace where it's well exposed, but it's also someplace you can get to it um, to do maintenance. And that's, that's a real trade-off with, with uh, any instruments on the ships. This is, of course, uh, this is uh, the bow mast, I believe, on one of the Huey ships. And it's a really nice exposure. You know, you have this open lattice kind of mast, good airflow. Um, you know, the sensors are, are, are well exposed out on the front of the ship. Uh, the radiometers are exposed to the atmosphere, you know, really well. Uh, and of course, this mast can gimbal down for maintenance. The problem is you really can only do that in port. So, you know, there's no real way you're gonna do anything to these, you know, during a cruise if something, if something goes wrong, so but it is a good example of exposure. For thermometers and for the hygrometers, which are on the next slide, the, the main thing with these is again, you wanna mount them as far forward as possible on the ship and as high up as you can get them uh, to get away from the, the, the heat contamination of the ship itself. You know, the, the ship's a giant block of metal heating in the sun. Uh, so you will get these diurnal problems where you'll get uh, heating of these instruments if they aren't someplace where they're well ventilated uh, and, and exposed to the air. Ideally, you need to you want to have a shield of some kind, whether it's a passive or an active ventilation shield. Um, and uh, again, you know, having forced ventilation is great on these systems, which is a little easier to do on a ship, of course, because power is less of an issue uh, as it is on something like a buoy. Sea spray, as I mentioned, is a nemesis of particularly the hygrometers because that salt contamination can affect the measurements. So um, one of the things I, it, what I'm putting on here, I was showing a couple examples of photographs of, um, you know, some, some, sh some ships that had instruments and in locations or have instruments and in locations that may or may not be ideal. Um, this is an example from one of the NOAA ships of an absolute poor location for temperature and humidity, you know, underneath the the the, the wheelhouse with you know up and ne next to a wall aft of the the the, the superstructure. There's just no way this was ever going to measure good temperature. All it's measuring is the heating of the ship. It's just too close and too poorly ventilated. 
Um, this, of course, is the kind of thing that um, you can really easily fix, which I'll show on the next slide. This is a, a newer photo I had not actually seen from one of the Scripps ships, and it's not necessarily, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, you know, be negative to any of the operators about their installations. This was one that where uh, what struck me about this was the clustering of the sensors. They're all, they're all bunched together. And the problem that can cause is, you know, when you have airflow trying to go around all these different uh, devices, uh, you may be getting issues with one sensor or another, depending on which way the wind is blowing into that cluster. It's better to get your sensors spread as far apart as you can uh, to give them better exposure. Uh, a number of these, I believe, are ventilated, actively ventilated, which does help uh, in that situation. As I mentioned, that previous ship uh, that I showed for the NOAA ship, here's the solution. They actually moved the sensors, this is their temperature humidity, up on the rail, their barometers now, the, the port for the barometers now up on the rail, better exposed. Um, you just will get better airflow. Certainly if these were higher or further out away from the rail, it would be even better, but this is definitely was a big improvement on their, on their measurements. With the barometer, the main thing to do is, uh, the main thing to emphasize is your barometer itself, the physical instrument, can be anywhere on the ship, but it has to actually be connected to a port that goes out to the outside world. You know, it has to be getting its, its air from the outside of the ship. If you have this thing sitting inside an air-conditioned lab, um, you're not going to get accurate pressure measurements because those condition spaces, you know, the pressure's changing as people open doors and the air conditioning is running. The, in terms of the pressure tubing that you put out, the it has to have one of these kind of ports on it because that'll help uh, control the, the the dynamic pressure changes caused by wind and airflow. Uh, pressure sensors are very sensitive to airflow, uh, so that's one thing that's an absolute must. The other thing that we find one of the most common problems in terms of maintenance of pressure sensors is that tubing itself. If it gets cracked and water gets into it, your pressure measurements will be no good because all of a sudden you have an incompressible fluid inside your, your pressure tube. And we've seen that on a number of ships through the years. So in terms of maintenance, the biggie is just to make sure that that pressure tubing is, is uh, you know, dry and, you know, in, in good condition. In terms of wind sensors, um, again, this is an example. This is actually showing from one of the uh, flow models for the RCRV when it was being uh, designed. The, the main thing is when you have airflow coming from the front of the ship, your best exposure is someplace either you know, near the front or high up where the air is flowing much more smoothly over the ship. Uh, you don't want to be in a place where you have all this turbulence, you know, like in the back of the ship or, or down close to the deck. Um, you do want to get it as high as possible uh, up above the uh, the main mast or on the bow mast where it will be best exposed uh, under different conditions. Ideally, if you have the situation where you can mount multiple sensors, this is great. Um, these are two examples of some well-exposed anemometers. Um, the first one is on the Atlantic Explorer where they have port and starboard mechanicals and a sonic all the way up at the top. The only thing that really improved this is taking these mechanicals and shoving them further out so that they're actually further, you know, further out port and starboard. Um, but that's a really nice exposure. Another example I like to show, this is the old uh, NOR. And in this photo, if you look closely, you'll see five different anemometers on the ship. Um, they have one up on the bow mast, uh, really well exposed forward. Port and starboard on this, this uh, midship mast, and then port and starboard way up on the main mast. Um, all those are very well exposed, uh, you know, in, in terms of their locations because they're on pretty small structures. So the structure themselves is not causing a lot of problems. And they're way they're as high up as you can get and as far out as you can get on the on the on the mast. In terms of radiometers, the big thing, of course, is you want to see a clean view of the sky as best you can. So this is, again, this is one from one of the Scripps ships showing them up on the top of the, 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 the bow mast, great location for them. Again, it can be a challenge to maintain them when they're there. You, know, you have to lower the mast to get to them. 
So there's always a trade-off between, you know, putting them someplace where they get a good view of the sky versus where can you get to them to clean them. So, you know, it is possible to put these on something like the doghouse, you know, for the, for the winch, you know, in the back of the ship where it's easy to get to them. They have a nice view of the sky. The only thing you have to remember if you're going to do that, if you're after the stack, you're going to have to go out and clean them frequently, probably, you know, at least once a week, you know, maybe even, you know, more frequently than that. So it, it is always a trade-off on where you put them. For rain sensors, uh, rain is almost it a very difficult measurement to do on a ship because of the airflow issues. Uh, any place where there's a strong updraft or a strong downdraft um, in the airflow, your, your funnel type volumetric gauges are going to overcatch or undercatch. Um, you know, that's just the nature of it. If they're aft of a structure where rain's going to fall and the water's going to come off that structure, you're going to have problems too. So these three dots are kind of examples of places where you probably would be pretty good with a rain sensor. You'll notice the flow is pretty flat in these cases. Um, but also, again, optical rain gauges are showing much more promise, especially the newer ones, um, at, at, at making much better measurements than the volumetric gauges, because they're less affected by that, um, the orientation of, of the, the, the airflow through the, through the sensor. So my major takeaway on this, it's always a compromise between the best location for the sensor and the operational realities on the ship. You know, you need to get it someplace where you can maintain it um, and but also be well exposed to the atmosphere. Uh, the general rule of thumb called this, you know, my rule of thumb as far forward and as high as possible. That is the almost every meteorological sensor will be happy if you can put it, you know, forward and high. Because uh, most ships, most of the time, unless you're on station, you're moving forward. So that's the best exposure uh, for, for, for those sensors. So, Katie, do you want to do a quick 101 on your, we're, we're shifting topics again, going into data. And we'll try to get through this so we can open it up for questions. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to put this up to just remind everyone of the importance of metadata and really understanding your, your data life cycle. So data capture, you know, is something that's a one-time event and time and space. It only happens at one point. You cannot ever get that back. So the metadata associated with that data creation point is critical um, to be able to make sure it's accurate. And so you have quality data as you, as you follow through and go throughout the entire data, data life cycle from data creation to data archive. Now there's a lot of stuff that goes into that, but one of the most crucial components is sensor health and history. And this is something that's actively evolving um, and in intricately tied to data quality at data capture. So it's just a good reminder to, to consistently think about how your practices affect data quality and how good your data quality is at that moment for data capture and following it through the data life cycle to data archive. So this is just one of those public service announcements. Think about your data life cycle and um, all of the components that fit into it uh, to ensure that we're providing good quality data. So next slide, it gets back to Sean. Yeah, so the last part of this is kind of the, uh, the end of that data life cycle, at least in this is for the, uh, for the university fleet and some other ships that provide their data to the rolling deck to the repository. Um, so again, I mentioned not all techs deal with um, these distros. It depends on your, your, your management and how data is managed. But just for those who are not familiar, a post-cruise data distribution or a distro uh, was initially designed to be a copy of the same data that basically gets handed to the chief scientist at the end of the cruise. So it includes all your underway sensor data, your navigation, your MET, your flow-through systems, all your sonar data. It's this giant data tarball, effectively. Um, and the idea is it's packaged into a single post-cruise data distribution that gets walked off the ship um, after it's handed to the chief scientist and their copies walked off the ship and usually transferred to a local storage uh, shoreside that then R2R actually can come and, and, and load onto, our, onto the R2R system. 
So one of the things that R2R recommends, this was developed almost a decade ago, I think, uh, through RV Tech uh, and working with RV Tech is a, a directory structure um, for those distributions. And the idea is to organize the data by crews um, and have you know folders that contain your documents. And then for each of your devices, your you know your ADCP, your your flow through system, your you know fluorometer, whatever, you have a in each device folder you have your documents, your raw data, your process data, um, and then you would have a separate folder for science party you know, kind of data. So if like they're they're bringing their own science sensors on board and hooking them into your system, because um, R2R generally doesn't do anything with this. Um, they're working with these device and document level information. Of course, the other thing we emphasize here is try not to put any PII in your distros. This is a, the bane of most people's existences, especially when you're trying to put these into a national archive. Uh, the, the, you know, the NCEIs of the world don't like to have PII in their, uh, their, their data centers. So... But the, the, having this constant directory structure really helps uh, R2R when it comes to breaking out the data. They basically take that data, use a regex approach to break out different data sets by those devices. And having this directory structure makes it very easy for them to pull out the MET station and the, you know, the fluorometer and separate the different, the different data sets. Yeah, and hey, Sean, real quick, uh, what's PII? Mm -hmm. Go ahead uh, personally that. identifiable information. So all those fun things like, you know, well, for one, everything from like photographs of, you know, personnel uh, can be an issue, especially when you're dealing with students, you know, that's a, that's a big problem, uh, but also anything that has to do with uh, emails and social security numbers and that kind of stuff, you know, you, you don't want to include any of that in this, in these distros. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in terms of minimum metadata, Drew kind of put this together for me, um, but for one of these distros, in order to work with them, one of the things that's really helpful is having a checksum file listing. Um, if there is a list of MD5 checksums for that whole distribution, they can verify it when they copy it to make sure that they get a complete you know, data set over from your server to their server. Um, Having accurate device information, knowing what devices on the ship during that cruise is, is really important. Um, and then data file format descriptions. Um, the, the file formats, what we found is that uh, oftentimes the data distribution may not change, you know, or the data file name may not change, but something in the file has changed. You've added one column of information in, the, you know, in, in that, uh, that data file. Um, or removed something, and the file format doc doesn't change. So then when somebody goes to reuse that file, the format doesn't actually match the data. Um, and so that can be complicated. And R2R doesn't have the resources to open up and review every data set to make sure that the, the format matches the file. So it really depend on, on, on you all to supply you know, you know, the right format for the file that you're providing us. So the final slide before we open up for questions is just kind of examples of things that go wrong with these distros. Um, so from one cruise to the next, one of the things that's a real challenge is when we see overlapping information, you know, in a cruise directory from the previous cruise. So there's like data, like a CTD cast from the previous cruise is in this cruise's, you know, directory. And that just messes things up when they're trying to break data up by cruise. Um, any changes in the directory structure or file naming, something that's tweaked during the cruise can cause problems with the regex that they use to break out the data. So these kind of changes, if they happen, they, if they can be documented and provided is very helpful. Um, mismatches with the cruise dates and the data dates. You know, you have, you know, a cruise date from X to Y, but the data is from Y to Z. You know, that's those are the kind of things that can make breaking out the data very difficult. We already talked about the documentation and, you know, the device listing, knowing which devices are on the ship and running is really important. We do this, we, we do periodic every, you know, uh, year to every six month kind of uh, reviews with the different operators on the devices. We are working toward trying to provide this, you know, get to a point where we can provide these device updates electronically. 
so there's some prototypes being done both with uh, the RCRV group as well as uh, the SCS group uh, in NOAA to you know, standardize a JSON XML for doing these exchanges. So that's everything. That was longer than we had hoped, but um, you know, hopefully we provide a lot of good info and yeah, now the floor is open for you to pick our brains. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, if people have any questions or comments or want to start up a discussion, please go ahead and either raise your hand or put a question in the chat. Um, it looks like while we are uh, talking, um, there was uh, Maximilian said uh, could consider salt away to assist in cleaning certain sensors. Um, Max, did you want to go ahead and um, say anything more on that? Was that in terms of MET sensors? Um, yeah, this, this thought just uh, came into my mind when Sean was talking about you know, the uh, certain sensors that are up on the mass that can accumulate salts. Uh, we have uh, used this product uh, successfully on our ROVs and, uh, and other devices. Um, so it's pretty good. It gets into the nooks and crannies where uh, fresh water sometimes has a hard time getting to. I can uh, recommend this product. Great. Well, yeah, it's a great tip. I was not, I'm not even familiar with that. So yeah, it'd be, uh, yeah it's a, that's a good one to, to know about. Yeah, and you can start like uh, with a little spray bottle with a with a diluted solution of it, you know, just to see how it affects uh, you know surfaces and stuff. Uh, but it, it's been doing pretty well with us. Just spray it, and then if you want to get more involved or you have a bigger system, then you just uh, uh, get a get a one of those bottles that you can hook up to a to a garden hose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Oh, come on. I'm sure most people have a lot of questions yes. and comments. I could even stop the recording if people are a little nervous. Uh, Matt, there we go. Yeah. You just unmuted yourself. Yeah, go I, ahead. Unmuted. I have to run in a, a second, but I was curious if anybody has experience with kind of closed systems like Ferry Box for, uh, it looks like Europe has tried to do that over the past bunch of years. Um, whether anybody in this group has worked with Ferry Box folks or um, whether there's value to that for boats that don't have as much technician power. I'm not too familiar with Ferry Box, but that's similar to like the Zap systems. Is that the one that's um, basically kind of automated and, and remote yeah. access and things like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that one, but that's the idea. Like something that's self-contained that can just be serviced by a, a manufacturer instead of an individual technician. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I don't have any direct experience with them in the field, but um, there's a company in, in the EU called Subsea Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, they have built um, various size uh, self-contained flow water systems, um, and they have been used quite successfully even on vessels as small as uh, racing yachts uh, going on around the world racing you know, races. Um, so that's another one that is a potential uh, for use. What was the one you said, Katie? Oh, zaps! It's Zap. a different. It's it's a typical system for like wastewater treatment facilities oh, and things okay, like that. But cool. they also put it on on vessels. But I know there's some manufacturers who are trying to work in some cleaning procedures and mm -hmm. checks and things like that to be able to monitor the health of the system. And as as many sensors get smarter, you're starting to get actually more and more output. So that's one thing we didn't really talk about is like thinking about the outputs that are generated from some of these sensors and utilizing them to their fullest capabilities. So a lot of the newer kind of MET sensors and things like that, they'll have sensor health status outputs that you can actually harvest. And then you, as a tech, have a means to be able to like monitor that more efficiently um, and have a better idea of like what troubleshooting, kind of what's wrong with the system. Um, so those are nice things to think about. And there are some tools and services, plug for Coriolix here, um, that can allow for some of that kind of monitoring for sensor health and system status. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. All right, uh, Lance, I think you're up next. 
All right. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking back to the sort of uh, drawing that Katie provided of a flow through system, like on the front end, right at the intake and got me thinking about our setup. So ours is, so the Kilo Moana being the swath vessel, our intake is actually really deep compared to a lot of other vessels, I'm sure. And I don't get a lot of questions from scientists about it or complaints, but I'm sure there are some. But any, I guess one of the big differences I tend to think of is we don't have any kind of like tank at the front. I think it's really just an intake pipe. And then we have a basket strainer and a sort of Y with two pumps, which are of the shredding variety. But I'm just kind of curious what what kind of difference it makes, if any, to have some kind of tank in the front end versus just a straight intake pipe. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question, Lance. And I've actually I've worked on the Kilo Moana probably more than any other ship. I almost died on that ship <laughs> from appendicitis. <laughs> so that's a that's another story. But um, I spent a lot of time on that ship. I've actually been down to the intake. I, I went down to it at one point and um, it was one of the reasons I actually started to get interested in science seawater system design. Um, but is there value to having a sea chest uh, other than than kind of what you have in place? Um, I think with, with bubbles and other things, there may be some value, um, but I, that was meant as a kind of general depiction. I know some ships actually don't have um, sea chests um, and they have a more similar to, to what you described. And I think uh, for the for the KM in particular, thinking about it's not necessarily a bad design um, for for your system setup, but really thinking about what you can implement along the way to help with quality. So so getting rid of the shredder pumps would go a long way, right? And in, in quality of particles. Um, I don't remember dramatic flow issues on that ship in particular. Um, and I do recall some issues with air bubbles and heavy seas, but um, I think that was, you, you do have a fairly deep intake. So I think just understanding your intake and um, working towards swapping those pumps out to, to diaphragm would go a long way. There are some design considerations to think about when switching to diaphragm, and I'm happy to provide kind of a document that outlines some of the things that you need to consider when switching to a diaphragm pump. You can have increase in pulsation. Uh, so there are ways to mitigate that through running the pump at an optimal speed and using a variable frequency drive. So there are definitely design considerations and engineering considerations that need to take place when thinking about swapping those pumps out. I'm happy to talk to anybody more about that. Um, but the value of not having a sea chest versus a sea chest, I'm not sure I've thought too much about, honestly. So the other comment that I would make is uh, from the air sea interaction and, and marine meteorology kind of community, I think, and it's probably true for a lot of the, the flow through sensors as well. I think the biggest thing is knowing the depth the water comes from um, and well documenting how far that water's traveling from, you know, where it comes in to, you know, when it gets to the sensors, you know, like the water wall. Um, clearly for, for marine meteorology, the intake temperature, the sensor that's as close as possible to the intake is what they want for, you know, measuring what an actual sea temperature is. Um, and this is something we've been talking about in the best practices group is how to document intakes and which one is in use because some ships have more than one, you know, some of them have more than one sea chest, you know, um, and just knowing where that water comes from at any given time um that's something the science folks will really really like to have carried along with the data uh that's that's great uh thank you yeah thank you for your question i've got a lot of love for the cam <laughs> hmm. all right anybody else any questions or comments 
I'm going to chime in here and ask a question. Um, on the Atlantis, well, one, we have a shredder pump and a diaphragm pump and can swap between them depending on the application. And there's definitely some drawbacks um, to the diaphragm pump that we encounter uh, that we don't encounter with the impeller driven pump and vice versa. And so depending on the application, we swap between them and it works great. The other thing is we have our sensor loop uh, downstream of the pumps. So the water um, is in our sensors, the water goes through our sensors before it ever sees the pump. Um, do you guys have any concerns about that? Is that preferred? Any Anybody else use that? Water goes through the sensors before it goes through the pumps. Yes. Correct. Um, uh, it is branched off, our sensor loop is branched off um, prior to the water going through the pump. It's on the section side. Hmm. That's, I'm not sure I've ever seen like that. The, uh, just like a CCD plumbing, right? The, the pump is at the end of the line. We used to have that on Ravel in the bath restaurant room. Yep, same idea. Okay, just keep throwing that out there. If you had any concerns about that, that just, just seems to be different of anyone or if there's an advantage to that. No, actually, that's a, that's a really good thing. That, again, Katie, we should take back to the flow through group because, you know, it's yeah. kind of this that idea of pulling water through the system or pushing water through the system. And yeah. I don't know that there's a, I'm certainly no expert in these systems, but it would be interesting if that group, you know, we had, had thoughts a lot. on that better temperature performance, obviously, with that setup. However, scientists were complaining about um, increases in bubbling, um, mm -hmm. that sort of issue. I could also see access if it's down, you know, if it's if that system's easily accessible. I think that's one of the design issues um, to take into consideration just making sure it's accessible but that's interesting to think about yeah thanks katie yeah it's sitting in our bow thruster room so um yeah we don't you know science doesn't willy-nilly go down there at all but there's an, it is uh still accessible it's just in the bow thruster room. yeah so i guess the only other thing to consider would be the piping runs to get it up from the intake to the bow thruster room and then back to the pumps to pump it through? Mm. All of it is located in the bow thruster room. Okay, everything's there. All okay. together in one spot. The pumps are, you know, within 10 feet or so of the intake and the sensor loop branches off before that. And as far as the pushing and pulling, we actually do use a tiny, just like pond pump or whatnot to get the correct flow rate and stuff through the sensor loop. So when scientists come on board, do they plug in in the bow thruster room or do they plug in in the lab or is it just dependent on the scientists? Mm. If science instruments are going on, they're hooking up in the lab. This is merely for a thermosalinograph, transmissometer, fluorometer. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. And then Sean, it sounds like you could take that back to the best practices group and see what they think of that setup as well. Uh, Brand Brandy, you have your uh, hand up next. Yeah, I was just curious about what um, issues um, Hui and Katie had seen with the diaphragm pumps that have them. What what happens that makes you switch back to the impeller? Yeah, obviously, if there's like biology going on and IFCBs and stuff going on um, on the ship, we're using the diaphragm pump for the critters. But with um, one with the diaphragm pump, it's more maintenance, seems like it takes more, a lot more care and feeding in general. Um, it has a VFD on it. And so it as you change water temperatures, things like that, you can do a lot, have to do a lot of tweaking um, with the pump rate, the air compressor rate and the VFD. And it's sometimes uh, more trouble than it's worth to keep it balanced all the time if you don't need it for the bug squishing purposes. That's fair. Do, is there, how does that get documented for the like R2R data or does it, does it get flagged which type of pump is in use? Oh, um, good. Point. It generally doesn't. Um, it doesn't get plugged with R2R. And I would say that 
if it's getting used in the lab samples at all, we're generally using diaphragm pump. Um, but if it's just, we're not doing anything else, but I need some seawater in the lab to wash my stuff and I'm taking thermosalinograph measurements, we're using the, uh, the impeller driven pump. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that discussion. Uh, Lance, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a just sort of generally thinking, I've seen some email traffic on the RV tech chain about standardization of some of, met, some of the MET sensors, like moving, I think it's away from Epley's or toward Epley's. I can't remember that chain specifically, but applying that to flow through systems. I mean, still MET systems as well, but it seems like every ship has a similar sensors, but a very different way in which they organize their flow through sensors and meteorological sensors. And I'm thinking, you know, like for the KM, we have uh, this sort of custom made starboard uh, wall with all these separate flow meters. And so there's like output hoses. So you can turn a needle valve get flow coming from the same intake and then that plugs into a quick connect and then there's science can use whatever and somewhere else maybe they have to create their own i don't really know but is there a discussion about standardizing across flow through systems where thermocells and fluorometers are involved or you know making like a, a standard design of a wall which has seawater outputs on it for science to use. I think that's a conversation that needs to happen in the community. This is just my opinion. Um, but especially as we see sensors being cycled out. So one, one good example is the Epley's um, in terms of MET sensors. The other example would be Many systems have single channel, channel um, wet star fluorometers in line. A lot of ships are now moving to the um, combination sensor, sensors, so the eco triplet in line. Um, and I don't think standardization is a bad thing when we think of fleet, the fleet as a whole. Um, that includes academic research fleet and NOAA fleet, thinking about these measurements and how scientific, scientists utilize them. There's a lot of platforms out there taking measurements in time and space. So there's a lot of value to being able to compare apples to apples um, and honey crisp apples to honey crisp apples uh, if we want to get down to it. So I think um, I think that that needs to that conversation needs to happen. And I think within at least the general flow through best practices work group. We're not going to recommend sensors per se or talk about sensors, but um, in terms of design, that's something that we could consider as standardization of um, the setup itself. Yeah, thank you. Brandy, did you want to add to that? I have a whole nother topic, actually. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess just, just to add to that a little bit more, um, that's kind of um the oceans best practices groups um that katie and sean and i are all kind of involved in is kind of taking that look because um ocean science in general isn't very standardized when you look at it across you know all the different research vessels and all the different sensors and how people kind of operate and use them um so that's kind of the uh, the goal of the ocean's best practices is to get, you know, kind of these best practices in place, um, have people adopt them and use them and kind of use them in their data as well. So if you want to get involved with that, we can definitely forward you on some more information. All right, uh, Brandy, go ahead. Yeah, so something that's come up uh, recently is um, seabird. Um, so we have a pretty heavy reliance on seabird sensors, both in CTDs and in underway seawater systems. And their business practices of late have resulted in longer and longer lead times for the calibration of sensors. 
Um, and unfortunately, the nature of the beast is that there aren't a lot of alternatives uh, at this point. Um, and so I'm curious, a lot of the like, getting a sensor calibrated annually comes down from the manufacturer saying this is something you need to do annually but if their lead times are six months to get something calibrated and returned i'm curious if there has been any looking at how often does a sensor actually need calibrated versus um manufacturer recommendations um so that we could make some better educated guesses or plans <laughs> at, that relate to specifically the sensor and not the, um, you know, being stuck with whatever the manufacturer says. Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up, Brandy. And um, this is such a crucial point. And it like, honest, if I'm being honest, it boils down to training and knowing your sensor and knowing your data and what it should look like. I think, you know, Seabird, of course, they're going to say, and I probably shouldn't record this, but <laughs> of course they're going to say, it's okay, <laughs> that, yeah, we should calibrate this. You should calibrate this every year. But I think if we as a community um, can have better training resources and best practices at our disposal to understand, number one, what our measurements are, what they should look like, and number two, how to monitor our sensor health, um, that can go a long way in us being able to make an educated decision about whether or not it really needs to go to the factory for calibration. Now, what I will say is we have to be careful with that. Like some sensors have to be calibrated um, and there's many, many institutions don't have the infrastructure or the support to be able to do that. Um, there are some that exist. So maybe it's starting to think about this model within UNALS, within NOAA, about having, you know, regional support centers that can help, that have the infrastructure to help us do this. There are a lot of things we can do, though, out at sea to be able to monitor. The CSTAR best practice that's out there is um, one good example. Uh, from working with a C-Star and other optics for over a decade, I can tell you that there are many things you can do um, that don't require you to send it into Cal to be able to monitor its health and coefficients over time. Dark counts, air counts, these types of validation measurements. Um, so I would argue that there's a lot that we can do that will allow us to make educated decisions about whether or not we really need to send it in for factory Cal. And then on a larger community scale, have these conversations about, we are seeing issues with Seabird um, and being able to have, you know, turnaround time. We're also seeing some quality issues with what we're getting back. So what would, can we do as a community to take on maybe some of that responsibility by supporting infrastructure and people um, on a regional scale to be able to, to help us take care of these sensors and these systems? I would like to uh, talk a little bit further and maybe offline. Um, as someone who is thinking about the RV tech agenda coming up uh, and training opportunities for that, um, if there are, um, you know, it, you say there are these things that you can look at um, for particular sensors, like how can we tell people what those are? <laughs> how can we, yeah. and wh which things can we like potentially which institutions have the infrastructure to uh, potentially look at it? Because you know, if we funded a facility of our own that is calibrating our sensors for us instead of having to go to Seabird, um, those are realities that could potentially happen if we can um, coordinate and and educate ourselves a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think there there may even be an opportunity to bring science into this, right? Like like scientists in many of their laboratories have, you know, this equipment, these facilities to be able to do some of these checks. And, you know, um, there is a lot that we can do to validate our measurements and that we should be doing for best, best practices anyway. And that all ties into sensor health, but yeah, let's have the discussion. Um, let's talk about it. Let's, let's work on training. I know that's something that I'm really focused on here with the survey technicians and NOAA as well. There's a scientist with the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series that tends to let us know <clears throat> when the uh, the thermosal needs to be swapped out. 
So I, it, we don't do like a, a periodic cal with that. We have one that's always calibrated kind of in stock and we kind of just wait for, for them to tell us it's time. Or at least that's what's been happening the past couple of years because they notice before we do. Yeah. And that's a good point too. Like starting to think about how we're monitoring the data and working with community partners to monitor the data and help us kind of understand when things are going wrong. This again boils down to that. Let's have some tools and services that help us understand when our sensors are going downhill. And you see that with PCO2 systems, like that's really common with a lot of the installations with PCO2 systems is you actually have people on shore looking at the data and telling you when something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, Katie. Yeah, I would just throw in there um, as far as doing, I, I don't know, self calibrations or monitoring or whatnot um, and following the manufacturer's recommendations or not, I find typically my average science user is the biggest critic of calibration dates saying manufacturer says one year at Seabird, I want one year at Seabird and I will accept nothing less. I don't care what your paperwork says. Yeah, yeah this is exactly why I was wondering if there's research being done into it, because if we can have white papers or something that say, you know, here's the data that says it's this, then um, we have some uh, muscle to say back. Oh, but they're working. Trust me. <laughs> Got yeah, it. and I think I think this fits into you know the idea of if we have facilities in place, if we have the infrastructure in place to do this. You know, how does is this is this acceptable to science? I mean, it. I would think it would be if we were able to conduct these calibrations. I mean, you see this at some other institutions. Um, Hui scripts. They're doing a lot of this work. What is the scientist feedback from them? I, I don't anticipate they have a problem with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are, these are good conversations to have. Yeah, and we could even, I mean, if we had these different hubs or calibration hubs, you could, I think you can get like ISO accreditations as mm -hmm. a metrology lab. I believe LUMCON just got a big grant with NIST. I mean, these are opportunities that we should be taking advantage of and um, when we can. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more question. If anybody else has one more burning question that they want to pose to our speakers or this audience. All right. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sean and Katie, for presenting and, um, you know, educating us on this topic. And uh, yeah, and thank you for uh, the tech training subcommittee for hosting this. And everyone Thanks. have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks.